Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Delmar. And again, we are talking about a very interesting subject. This is from the book Mind Over Matter, a picture of the Lubavitcher Rebbe when he was a little bit younger. But the Lubavitcher Rebbe, of course, you would think, okay, a rabbi knows about his Judaism, of course. But he did go to Sorbonne, and he was an engineer, and he liked to talk about science as a complement to Judaism. We're talking about today, of course, there's a lot of subjects in science in its own right, but we're talking more about the medical field and how from medicine you can learn something about Judaism, and from Judaism you can learn something more about medicine, and we can integrate the two studies together in many different levels. Now this is called prescriptions, physical and spiritual proper use of medications. Anybody who walks into a pharmacy worthy of its name and sees the many remedies which can help and heal so many diseases, even very dangerous ones, is certainly very impressed. Yet the pharmacist must explain to his visitor, and even more importantly to himself, that the entire collection of medications serves as no more than a preparation. For the patient to be healed, there are two central requirements. A, a prescription from an expert doctor as to exactly which remedy to take for this particular ailment, as well as instructions about how to take it. And B, actually taking the medicine in accordance with those instructions. Similarly, every single Jew is an emissary of the King of Kings. He is given a portion of this world which is his job to heal and fix. At the same time, he is given all of the needed remedies and materials. However, that is no more than a prerequisite. There is still a need for an expert's instructions prescribing exactly which remedy should be applied today, which tomorrow. Without that expert advice, he may endanger rather than heal and he may destroy rather than build. One might argue the entire community is holy, and I am one of them. I can make my own inquiries into the code of Jewish law and thus decide on my own how I must behave, both personally and with regard to the, my purpose in this world. Such a person may be compared to someone who immediately upon learning to read by his medical books and doctor's implements and announces that he can now heal the ill. Even more important is the actual work. Even someone who understands his illness and its cures very well and has respectfully consulted expert medical advice and has in his hands the exact prescribed medication will not even begin the process of healing until he actually takes the medication even if he has all kinds of excuses, such as that the time or place is not right, or that he does not have enough influence, that only makes a difference as far as reward and punishment are concerned, meaning to be able to determine whether he is guilty of intentional de dereliction, unintentional, or even if he is forced, in which case he is free of responsibility. His ailment, however, remains in full strength. Since the divine intent is that he should heal himself, it is obvious that all of his excuses are mistaken and are no more than the evil inclination's way of disturbing his service. Poisonous remedies. Deep inside the pharmacy, there is another section. It is warning signs all around. Danger, poison. Why is there poison amidst all of these helpful remedies? A wise man understands that what would normally be poisonous for a healthy person may, in exceptional cases and in controlled quantities, be the only medication that is able to save the patient. Continuing with our, the, uh, our illustration of this parable, we can find two areas that correspond to this poison between man and his fellow. The Torah is a Torah of kindness. Its ways are ways of sweetness, and all its paths are peace. Nevertheless, if, for instance, a person is invited to eat at another's home, and he is not certain about the food being kosher, 
He may not eat at all, even if that will cause his host public embarrassment. If someone is a Shabbos, a Sabbath desecrator, but there is reason to believe that he might stop if he is continually reminded about it, obviously this is talking about a case where it is already politely pointed out with no success, there is an obligation to do so until he screams or even until he hits. If a person sees a group educating its members and students not to believe in God, his Torah and his mitzvahs, he is obligated to strongly protest. He must inform that, that even if they are saving the student's life in this physical world, they are destroying his soul and his internal life. It is a commandment to save lives, and thus the children must be saved from them even in normally unacceptable manners. Just in a situation where their bodily lives are, lives are endangered, you have to do whatever you can to save a person. There is, of course, the usual question. I am a polite person. Even according to Jewish law, manners precede Torah. How can I scream at a person and embarrass him in public? The answer is this type of behavior for a healthy person would indeed be poisonous. But under certain dangerous circumstances, it is the only way to save this person from certain death. And also the second category now is between man and his creator. Similarly, there are some who complain against the Hasidic custom to spend so much time studying Hasidic philosophy and meditating on those concepts before our prayers, since they constantly miss the prescribed time for reading the Shema and praying. The reply is certainly for healthy pre people this would be harmful, but those who are spiritually ill have no other choice. Without doing so, the prayers will be just with the lips and not with the heart, which would render them completely invalid. However, as in the parable, there must be extra care taken to do so only in controlled quantities and only when prescribed by an expert doctor. Now this is from a, a talk from the Rebbe. Toxicity levels aren't universal. The question is, why is it that if a person transgresses a ruling that is accepted in his community, it can cause great spiritual danger, damage, whereas the same deed for someone in a different community, it may not be considered wrong at all? And the reply is, when someone ingests something poisonous, the most extreme measures are needed to save him. There are, however, certain materials that are only harmful to certain areas of the body. For instance, if someone eats the peels of a potato or melon, these may not have any nutri nutritional value, but they also pose no danger. If, however, they get stuck in the lungs, there is a real danger to life. The same is true with regard to our spiritual well-being. There are sins that are equally forbidden for every single Jew. These are poisonous for the soul are even harmful to the body. However, there are other actions that may only be harmful for certain Jews. For instance, if an Ashkenazic Jew marries two wives, and that's someone from Europe, he has transgressed on an, a terrible offense. Well, if a Sephardic Jew, someone more like North Africa or the Middle East kind of Jew, it is completely permitted. Uh, maybe I should digress and explain this a little bit. Um, would be caused that really, and you can read in the Bible also, for example, that Jacob had more than one wife. So, and there are other instances, but not to get into all the instances, once, but it suffice that we see that in Torah, a man can have more than one wife, but a wife cannot have more than one husband. In any case, that was the ruling for thousands of years, but finally in Europe, I mean, literally you're talking a thousand years ago, that the rabbis decreed you cannot have more than one wife. It wasn't part of society. We see it isn't today in modern Western society. I mean, not only today, hundreds of years ago. But in the, I mean, Sephardic land, which, like I just said, is the Middle East, which means the Arab countries, that was a norm, and they accepted that. So the rabbis didn't come out against it because that was the norm in the Middle Eastern countries. 
So therefore, we do have little differences in Judaism amongst different groups. And just let me, I know people always say, well, there's so many differences. The differences are small compared to the whole structure of Judaism. I always say, and I didn't count out, but 98%, 99% of all Jews are doing the same thing. But true is, true is true that there are small differences. This is one of them between European Jews and the Fardic Jews. So let me just say one more point. I mean, could explain and go on for my lectures forever, but just it's an important point that this is an extra idea. You don't have to have more than one wife. It doesn't say that. You're allowed. That's a very major difference. You're, you don't, you're not obligated. You're allowed to have. So if you don't, you don't. You know, so it's not a sin. So therefore, that's why the rabbis said the decree can have more than one wife. Now, the same thing with the country that we live in, or any country. I mean, the Jewish people haven't been in Israel for 2,000 years. And so the rabbis actually also stated that you have to hold by the law of the land. Now, if they tell you that, for example, against Judaism, everybody on one day has to have some ham, well, then you don't listen to the government. But if it's permissible, then, or as part of normal day life, you really are obligated to keep the law of the land. Now, in the United States, of course, we know that you have, can't be a polygamist, you cannot marry more than one wife, which anyway is against Torah, like we just say, the rabbis decreed it, but even if someone said, well, that's my custom, I'm going to do it, you're still not allowed, even if Judaism allows it, Jewish law allows it, because the United States law doesn't allow it, and you have to keep United States law. If it be an obligation to have two wives, for example, then that we'd have an argument. But like I said, it's not an obligation. It's just permissible. So if you don't, you don't. And that's, that would be just to round out the whole idea, get off my tangents, but I just wanted to explain it very clearly. Now here's a very beautiful idea, sterilization before injection. The Alter Rebbe, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, writes in his basic work, Tanya, all of the above, meaning all having personal fast, because there is the idea of fasting in order to purify yourself, he says, and this is really 200 years ago, should be replaced by charity. Although that may add up to a large sum, one need not worry about the dictum that one should not give away to charity more than a fifth, which is 20%, obviously. After all, this is not considered giving it away. He is giving it in order to redeem his soul from fasting and suffering. Thus, it is no worse than medicine for his body or his other needs. This expression is always in my mind, the Rebbe writes, whenever I see some aspect of physical medicine, I think of the correlations of spiritual healing. Let me just explain it also for another minute. Meaning a person would have a budget. They always say when you buy a house, it shouldn't be more than a quarter of your, you know, monthly wages. And there's all these kind of things financial people tell you. So if you don't have the money, you don't go out and buy a Lexus. And maybe you don't even buy a new car. You only have money for a used car. And that would be normal. Keep in your budget. And so, too, Judaism says, you know, charity, beautiful, biggest mitzvah. But, you know, you don't give all your money away. You know, you, there is a budget. 10% is basic. And like he says, at the most, even if you're very, very charitable, you shouldn't give more than a fifth, 20%. Now he says that in order to avert fasting, you should give a lot more away. He says, well, wait a minute, that's more. You just said you shouldn't give more than 20%. And he gives this example. Well, of course, if you're buying a house or, let's say, a car, and you don't make that much, you don't go and buy a brand new Lexus. If you don't have the money, you don't have the money. Don't do it. Don't buy it. But what if there's a medicine, we're talking about medicines again, and unfortunately some medicines cost a lot of money and it does break the budget for a lot of people, unfortunately. But what are you going to do? Doctor says you have to get this medicine. Yes, it costs a lot of money. It's beyond your budget. But what are you going to do, not buy the medicine? Of course you buy the medicine. Even if it just costs, it breaks your budget, breaks the bank for yourself, you do whatever you can to get healed. So that's what he's saying, that charity is 
spiritual healing, so you give as much as you can to get yourself healed. Today, some doctors come to, came to give me an injection. This is um, from the previous Rebbe. I noticed that they were extremely careful. They checked and sterilized their implements. Both the doctor and his assistant dressed in whites, washed their hands two or three times, and even checked under their fingernails to make sure that there wasn't a bit of dirt. After all that, they rinsed their fingertips in a strong solution to eliminate any residual bacteria. After all of those preparations, they sterilized my foot two or three times with an alcohol solution and with other preparations that eliminate microscopic dirt as well. When I saw how careful they were being, I asked, why do you need to clean it so much? I just bathed my foot. They responded that nonetheless they must sterilize the area of the injection with alcohol to avoid the slightest bacteria. If not, there is a possibility that the bacteria would enter the body together with the injection that would not only render the injection useless, it could cause all kinds of new and dangerous infections. A corresponding idea in spiritual healing. They says when people get together and they try to better themselves, and this is more of a Hasidic custom, I don't know if people in the world think to do that, but they, you come together and work things out maybe like group therapy, but not, a, not that many people do that. It's not that it's such a bad connotation, but just getting together with friends and trying to be better people. The speakers demand that the people gather, that they better their behavior, that they set aside time for more learning, that they keep to these times, and that they learn with the intent of fulfilling that which they learn. Although these demands result from true love, they are usually received as an injection is with a little prick. It is important to remember that although that getting together is, so to speak, a spiritual medicine, which truly enlivens the soul and is a great benefit for at such times that there is still truly a, that these ideas should enter your mind and your heart, there is still a need before such injections, you know, to tell someone to better themselves. No one He's just trying to say no one wants to hear about, you know, uh, how they're wrong. Everybody wants to hear how they're perfect and they're beautiful. So still, you can't better yourself if you think you're perfect. So therefore, if you have true friends out of true love, not like, ha-ha, you did something wrong, but someone who truly wants to help you to clean and sterilize both the needle and the site of the injection. If one is not properly careful in this regard, some external dirt may enter the wound and may, God forbid, cause serious damage. Well, this is an important idea also. Again, it's really more of a Jewish and Hasidic idea of trying to help out and become better. Really, people just go along and do everything for what they think is good. And, you know, no one wants to better their friend, but really... I mean, you know, to get together, a truly friend, maybe you would see something wrong, not out of ha-ha-ha, but out of true love, to try to have your friend uh, do something more. This is talking about now is the, about blood. And you also, you have to have pure blood also. So he says, uh, the story reads the Alta Rebbe. The story is of Lubavitch Rebbe. He says, this is the path, he explained, this is the path of the founder of Hasidus 250 years ago, the Baal Shem Tov. Every physical thing that we see or hear, we should utilize for the service of the Almighty. We worked very hard in order to achieve this quality, but for our children it happens automatically. He says, one who follows in the manner of the Baal Shem Tov and sees, that's really the theme of what we're saying. We see medicine, we see shots, we see a pharmacy. So I'd say, okay, that's the way it is, but we could learn, that's what we're trying to say at the beginning of the show, to integrate science or everything you see in here, really, for that matter, but we're really specifically talking about medicine, part of science, 
that you could use it to be a better person. And that's what we're trying to explain. Everything used for the service of God, I promise that he will draw down a good spark from heaven, which will assist him and his children in their service of God throughout the generations. Now, blood is warmth and life. There is our characteristics as the embodiment of holiness. After all, impurity and evil have no life or warmth of their own. They exist only to preserve man's freedom of choice, for God is testing you to know whether you follow his ways. This is why it is possible for a person to get excited over desires that are forbidden by the Torah. And even those that are permitted, but where the excitement is misplaced, obviously a lot of hard work is required to uproot these tendencies. So we have to purify our blood. We have to have good blood, be very, um, very careful in that regard. So here we're talking about a unique remedy for a unique ailment. Those who oppose the study of the deeper Kabbalistic mystical ideas, because some people, obviously myself, love the mystical ideas. Some people are so straightforward. You talk about God or mysticism to them, they get turned off. But now the uh, Rebbe is addressing those people who have two complaints. If it is a necessary study, why wasn't it around until now? If so many generations could succeed without using mystical ideas, because now you see Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, is, even movie stars, they're into it, but it wasn't that way, I'm just telling you, 100, 200 years ago. So people say, well, we didn't have that tradition. Why do you need it? And if they didn't have it in previous generations, it must be not so important. It is a form of study that lowers self-esteem for it nullifies materialism and ego. If you're into spirituality, you'll lessen materialism. This can be perceived as negative. The response to these claims, the Rama Maimonides writes that the healing of the spirit is the same as the healing of the body. In other words, we can derive a lesson in comparison for illnesses and cures for the spirit from many of the concepts we are familiar with in physical medicine. Generally, illnesses are caused by deficiency or malfunction in a particular part of the body. However, there is one disease in which nothing is missing in the body, but on the contrary, there is an extra bit of flesh. One might wonder, who does this bother? Nothing is missing. However, this is unfortunately an extreme harsh disease, often even worse than those caused by a defect. The new growth harms the area in which it resides and may often spread much farther. Just as this illness is different than all others, its cure is also unique. In every other case, one strengthens the body, while here the cure is to destroy the extra growth. That is the only way to truly heal the person. The above cures were developed only in recent generations, and the methods in which they are applied were fully developed even later. In fact, the research is still continuing. It is still understood that if a person refuses to use these cures because A, medicine is intended to strengthen the body, not to destroy it, and B, so many generations have passed that never used such treatments, so he doesn't want to listen to these new doctors and use their new cures. He'd rather, considering himself sufficiently expert, continue in the same path that his parents used to, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, such claims would be considered ridiculous. Of course, one should not only increase in strength in healthy parts of the body. On the other hand, unwanted and superfluous growth must be destroyed. In the past, this disease was so prevalent and not so prevalent and pronounced that it is now, and therefore wasn't researched so much. Moreover, methods of cure were unknown, as such knowledge has not yet been granted by heaven. Only recently, after the disease has unfortunately spread, did the Almighty ensure to first make the cure available and allow the discovery of the above-mentioned treatments. Every physical entity has a corresponding spiritual source. The same is true of this disease and its treatment, which have shown up in recent generations. They come as a result of the corresponding spiritual issue, which has also been introduced only in recent generations. 
We live in a time which is called the heels of the heels of the Mashiach, of the Messiah coming, after which will be fulfilled the verse, he made an end to darkness. Thus it is specifically now that the evil has become stronger. It is expressed in extreme ego and self-centeredness. In the past there was also haughtiness, but it was never expressed with the crassness that has come to characterize our era. In the physical realm, this has led to the development of a corresponding entity. Without any apparent reason or cause, growths and tumors that steal the vitality and life force from the body, as if the entire existence of the body is only for their sake. The Almighty provided us with a cure even before the disease, and he revealed to us this mystical ideas which completely destroyed the diseased ego and sense of self. It is obvious that there is one detail in which the two are not comparable. In the parable, if the over uses the treatment, it begin to destroy even healthy parts of the body. In the spiritual application, on the other hand, one can study more and more deeper ideas in Torah, and still it will only destroy the haughtiness and ego. The healthy part will only be strengthened for Torah strength and weakening, it weakens the animal soul while strengthening the godly soul. So again, here we go. We're learning about many ideas in medicine, science in general, but today's subject was medicine and how we can learn from both the medicine and also from the diseases how to act and react. And really the main thing, ideas from the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidus, that everything you see in here, it's not just religion, as we always say, is only for religion. But everything in the world was created by God, and therefore everything you see in here, the way things are, the way they are, must have a deeper reason, and have the, must have a deeper idea why it is so. And therefore we can take a lesson from it and just really achieve true unity in the world by seeing and incorporating worldly ideas into the oneness of Judaism. Thank you very much.